thank you for coming to my presentation. Um, my presentation is on the framing of sovereign gambling in Australian media coverage. Um, the authors for my paper today are myself, um, Associate Professor Samantha Thomas from the University of Wollongong, Dr. Priscilla Robinson from Macquarie University, and Professor Mike Dobb of Curtin University. Um, I'd just like to thank my employers who are supporting my attendance at this conference partially. Um, and there are no other conflicts of interest that we'd like to declare. Um, analysis of media coverage allows us to examine the key issues and debates about gambling and other public health issues. It also helps us to understand how the media shapes discourses about problem gambling and presents these to the public. In this analysis, we examine the framing of problem gambling, in particular whether problem gambling is framed as a public health issue in media coverage. Media analysis also allows us to explore who has the most influence over a debate. <coughs> We can examine which actors and sources are most frequently quoted in stories about gambling and draw conclusions about who is influential in shaping the discourse of the problem gambling. Media analysis has been used in research and other public health issues, including obesity, alcohol, tobacco, crime, and health generally. Um, however, although it's a very useful tool in understanding the discourses that surround this public health issue, very few studies have used this approach to problem gambling. So this presentation reports on the um, first large-scale me Australian media analysis of coverage of problem gambling. Um, the approach we took to our analysis was to use a qualitative content analysis of newspaper coverage of problem gambling. Uh, we aim to investigate how information about the causes and consequences of and the solutions to problem gambling was constructed within Australian news reporting. We really focused on the way that the public health played a role in framing the discussion around problem gambling in Australia. Um, we had four kind of research questions for our um, study. How do the news media frame the causes, consequences and solutions to problem gambling? What are the major topics and themes are covered and which is the um, particular types of gambling that are discussed? Which actors and sources of information do the media draw upon? And did any of the stories construct problem gambling as a public health issue or was it framed largely as a media, social or political issue? We used the Factiva database to identify articles relevant to problem gambling published between 1 July 2011 and 30 June 2012. Um, the study examines a period when there was a high level of political interest in gambling. In 2010, a hung parliament left key independent members of parliament holding the balance of power in the Australian federal election. One of these MPs, Andrew Wilkie, was strongly in favour of introducing harm minimisation measures for gambling regimes and made the introduction of a mandatory free commitment on all gambling machines, a condition of the formation of the Labor government. Mandatory pre-commitment requires that individuals must commit to a money to a limit before starting play with an individual locked out of all machines for a 24-hour period once that limit is reached. I know everyone knows that, but pre mandatory pre-commitment tends to mean different things in different debates. And even throughout the media coverage that we examined, there were some differences in what pre-commitment actually meant for different people. Um, this initiated a major national debate on gambling reform in Australia, which played out through the national media, intensive and aggressive industry lobbying against the reforms and the conduct of a number of federal employers into harm minimisation measures associated with various gambling products. Our study examined this period during which gambling was a major topic for media coverage. We included articles from eight major daily newspapers, The Age, The Sydney Morning Herald, The Herald Sun, The West Australian, The Advertiser, The Daily Telegraph, The Courier Mail and The Australian. Each article was downloaded and read, and articles that were duplicates or did not relate to problem gambling were excluded from the data set. We chose to include letters to the editor in our sample because we were interested in capturing the full breadth of debate around um, gambling reform. Our analysis involved an initial quantitative analysis which looked at the newspaper, the section, the major topics, news actors and sources, and the type of gambling discussed. We used Indivo to undertake a qualitative analysis by, uh, informed by framing theory. This theory describes how the media frames an issue by selecting and emphasising a number of aspects of a problem. The media defines problems, diagnoses causes, makes moral judgments and suggests remedies. These frames then encourage audiences to think, feel and make decisions about an issue in a particular way. Analysis involved open-ended reading and rereading of relevant sections of the article to identify themes relevant to the research question. Given our interest in how problem gambling is framed by the media, we were conscious of the influence of headlines, metaphors, keywords and stock phrases on how texts frame problem gambling. We were also conscious of the importance of sources and understanding how news stories are created and we examined the sources used in the articles and considered which actors had the greatest influence over coverage of gambling. 
There were 339 articles in our campaign total. Most of these articles were from the Australia and the Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, this shows that broadsheet newspapers were more likely to cover issues relating to gambling during the period studied. Fewer articles were published in the tabloid papers. Very few articles were published in the Daily Telegraph or the West Australian. Um, the limited number of articles in the West Australian is probably related to the fact that there are no gaming machines outside of the um, Perth casino. So um, gaming machine reform is perhaps a topic of less interest in Western Australia than it is in the rest of Australia. Um, most of our articles were taken from the main news section of the newspaper, although we had a substantial number of letters, speeches and opinion pieces in the sample. We had some articles from the sports section, most of which related to betting on sports or horse racing. Um, the major topic that was covered in the articles was the proposed Commonwealth Government reform associated with gaming machines, which is usually known as Pledge Movement. And that was covered in about two thirds of the articles. Um, other topics that were covered in only a small number of articles include gambling and sport, other types of gaming machine reforms, which including things like um, removing ATMs and gaming venues, um, community education or treatment programs, internet-based gambling, and um, detailed discussions of problem gambling. Um, most of the articles related to gaming machines, about 80%. Um, some articles referred to no specific product, but they just talked about gambling in general. Um, and a smaller number of articles discussed online gambling and sports betting. So, in lo although I know we're talking about um, online gambling at this conference a lot, and um, there has been an increased focus on internet gambling um, over the last few years, this wasn't reflected in the media coverage in the period that we studied. Um, there was a w an extensive coverage of sports betting advertising that occurred in Australia, but that was after the period that we studied. The gra this graph shows the range of different actors and sources that were used within newspaper reports. The largest group of voices were from state and federal politicians who featured in 196 articles, over half the sample. In addition, government agencies included in information in contained in government reports, such as the Influential Productivity Commission report released in 2010, were cited in another 81 articles, just under a quarter. Gambling industry representatives were the next most commonly cited voices, whether in the hundred... Okay. Um, many of these industry voices represented the gaming industry, most commonly clubs. Hotels and casinos were less frequently quoted, as were industry bodies from other types of gambling, such as sports bodies. This suggests that the club's lobby in particular was playing a key role in the debate over sleep travel, which was ongoing in the period we studied. People with a public health perspective on gambling were quoted much less frequently. Representatives from non-governmental organisations, including activists, anti-gambling campaigners and interest groups, were quoted in 15% of articles, with academics or academic research findings quoted in only 9% of articles, and medical and counselling professionals in only 3% of articles. Um, people who had personal experience with problem gambling were quoted in only 6.8% of articles, so very infrequently. Um, the analysis suggests that government and industry actors dominated the debate during the period we studied, with much less influence from people likely to put forward a public health view of gambling, um, and also not much impact I input from problem gamblers themselves. Uh, this is consistent with the highly politicised nature of the debate during the period we studied, and with the, the fact that gaming machine reforms at this time were largely being driven by federal politicians. Less than one in five of the articles discussed the causes of problem gambling. Um, most of these attributed problem gambling to factors associated with pricing of products by the gambling industry, including the marketing or promotion of gambling products, the accessibility of products, and the design of products. A number of articles frame problem gambling as an issue of individual responsibility. These articles are most likely to be found in tabloid papers, but not every second is reported as a problem gambling. Individualised factors associated with problem gamblers included individuals gambling to escape other problematic aspects of their lives, genetic factors or traumatic life events. Some commentary pieces discussed whether problem gamblers were responsible for the development of their own condition. For example, one letter writer highlighted the individual responsibility in the choice which gamblers make, stating that it is no one's fault except their own that they gamble. However, this was seen in only a small number of articles. Other articles featured commentary which argued that the industry was responsible for the causes of problem gambling. For example, uh, Senator Xenophon was quoted as saying the gambling industry wanted to put all the blame on the gambler and not take any responsibility for a dangerous product. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more in more detail about how industry responsibility was discussed. Most of these articles discussed the causes of problem gambling, attributed problem gambling to factors associated with products 
provided by the garment industry, including the marketing, the promotion of garment products, the accessibility of products, and the design of products. Concern about the marketing or promotion of garment products often focused on increased advertising and sports betting. This was discussed in 5% of IP articles. For example, articles reporting on the marketing strategies of the wagering industry to promote sports wagering products described this marketing as grooming children to be problem gamblers or increasing the risk of recovering gambling addicts returning to betting when odds were promoted at sporting venues. One article suggests that betting promotions during sport is making it difficult for some problem gamblers to recover. Accessibility was also reported as leading to problem gambling, with gambling available on every corner. This was mentioned in 3% of articles. These articles focus on the proliferation of poker machines, as shown in the following screens, or increased opportunity to gamble online with people with access and email. 8% of articles link problem gambling to the design characteristics of gambling machines. Machines are characterised as dangerous or evil, as shown, shown in that quote that I put on the slide there. Um, most of this commentary was designed to provide context for mandatory police mutiny, with commentary most commonly provided by politicians such as Andrew Wilkie and Congressman Xenophon, and by advocates and campaigners. The voices of problem gamblers were also represented in this debate, describing the impact of machines' characteristics on their problems with gambling. For example, one problem gambler stated that the dollars he sees in gambling machines had a powerful influence on the development of his addiction, while another described her physical response to particular teams' games. Concerns about the industry's role in causing problem gamblers led journalists, particularly at The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, to describe the business model of the, of the gambling industry as relying on the exploitation of gambling addicts, with problem gamblers vulnerable to the tactics of the industry. Um, moving on to the consequences of problem gambling. Um, these were discussed in about a third of all articles. More than half of these articles focused on social consequences, with less focusing on financial and health consequences of gambling. While the causes of problem gambling were largely associated with industry hardship, the consequences of problem gambling were most commonly presented as a result of individual behaviours, including a lack of control over gambling. Similarly, the consequences of problem gambling were usually framed from the perspective of individuals, either problem gamblers or their family and friends, rather than the community as a whole. However, responsibility for responding to the consequences of problem gambling was linked to industry and government as well as individual gamblers with many art articles and all publications discussing the consequences of problem gambling as a rationale for the Commonwealth Government's proposed reform. A range of actors were involved in discussing the consequences of problem gambling, with politicians commonly quoted. While most of these actors accepted that problem gambling was associated with significant negative effects, industry representatives in the coalition minimised the consequences of problem gambling by em emphasising that only a small number of gamblers experienced gambling problems. For example, a coalition policy document was quoted as referring to the small number of people for whom gamblers had tragic personal and financial consequences. Um, some details on the social consequences of problem gambling, which were reported in 66 articles, which is 19.5%. These articles discussed the ripple effect of problem gambling, whereby problem gambling impacted not only on individuals, but also on family members in society. Crime was discussed in 19 articles, and several articles stated that criminality and particular fraud were a direct consequence of problem gambling. The second social consequence of problem gambling was the negative impact of, on the well-being of families. Articles highlighted that problem families were often left devastated after an individual developed a problem with gambling. Children in particular were often portrayed as the victim, of, with articles stating that children were missing out on meals on the table and school excursions and were neglected because of poker machine addiction. As you can see from this presentation, at times, family members were described as the real victims of problem gambling. Um, in this context, many articles used family examples to argue for, real, for the reform of gambling machines. Um, articles discussing the financial consequences of problem gambling focused on the average amount spent by problem gamblers and the broader negative financial consequences for gamblers and their families. Official data from the Australian Productivity Commission were quoted to show that the average amount of money spent by a problem gambler in a year was approximately 21,000, noted in one article as a third of the average household annual income. However, tabloid papers often reported stories about problem gamblers who had lost large amounts of money. Problem gamblers were often quoted as discussing how they had lost control over the gambling. For example, the woman quoted on screen stating that she was sucked in and kept losing more and more money. I estimate I lost about $250,000, and that's not really what I can physically remember and account for, so there's probably more. Another problem gambler stated that he drank through the entire contents of his bank account. Fifteen articles described how problem gambling has caused problems with housing and homelessness. 
Um, the health consequences of problem gambling were discussed in eight percent of articles. A few articles mentioned the broad mental health consequences of problem gambling, including depression and anxiety. These articles focused on expert opinion and statistics provided by leadership bodies such as the Australian Medical Association and research commissioned by mental health charity Beyond Blue. It showed that individuals with a problem with gambling were nearly 20 times more likely to display severe psychological distress and nearly 2.5 times more likely to be depressed. 20 of these articles reported suicide or attempted suicide as a consequence of gambling, with several articles recounted the personal experience of problem gamblers who have contemplated suicide, primarily <coughs> because of financial debt. Consistent with the use of consequences of youth problem gambling in the debate over national gambling reform, many of the articles suggested tighter government control over the gambler could prevent suicide. For example, in an article reporting the suicide of a Melbourne casino worker after losing $4,000 in 29 minutes on a pokey swing, her mother stated that when poker controls on pokey time, it saves her life. Solutions to problem gambling were discussed in most of the articles and were commonly linked to the need for more comprehensive regulation by state and federal governments of the gambling and particularly the gaming machine industry. The most discussed solution was the implement of the implementation of the proposed national gambling reform, including the Anglican Free Commitment, which was discussed in nearly three quarters of the article. Oh. The implementation of a one dollar net per bet for a spin on gaming machines was mentioned in almost a quarter of articles. This could be as part of the National Gambling Reform Program as an alternative to the introduction of mandatory free commitments. Other solutions were voluntary free commitment mentioned in 16% of articles, counselling and treatment, restrictions on ban or ban on ATMs and gaming venues and a ban on advertising live odds during sports telecasts. Passage of these solutions, including voluntary free commitment, education and counselling, were promoted as an alternative to mandatory free commitments by industry and the opposition. <coughs> there was considerable debate about the reforms during the period we studied, with some publications such as The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald expressing more positive views about the proposed reforms and others, particularly the Australian, more likely to be critical. While some industry groups, including the gambling industry and sporting organisations, appeared to support some degree of reform to gambling reform, their public response were always framed around the need to protect individuals who are unable to take control of responsibility for their gambling, while protecting the rights of those who gambled responsibly. Opposition to increased gambling re government regulation as a solution to problem gambling was mentioned in 14% of articles. The key reason um, that were cited against increased gambling regulation, in particular mandatory free commitment technology on gaming machines, whether increased regulation would reduce individual liberty and freedom and promote a worsening nanny state. In some articles, mandatory pre commitment was opposed by industry as representing a cost to individual freedom, where ci citizens are wrapped up in cotton wool for their own good. The Liberal National Coalition authors of this line were listing a policy reported in the Sydney Morning Herald stating that a mandatory pre commitment scheme treats all gamblers as problem gamblers is at odds with the Coalition's core principles of personal responsibility and antipathy to anything that smacks smacks of a nanny state. This perspective was also backed by one tabloid newspaper editorial in Korean, Korean Mail that argued there will always be stupid narcissistic people who care little for the consequences of their gambling actions. They will have the right to be reckless and selfish with their money and well-being. Um, the next, this slide discusses the role of a public health voice in the debates around problem gambling. The vast majority of media reporting was influenced by political debates surrounding one particular type of gambling product, gaming machines, and the stimulus for the media coverage came largely from um, actions proposed by politicians. This differs from the normal, co normal course of media coverage around a public health issue where health agencies and academics first present and promote the evidence, then call for action, following which politicians respond and make decisions about as to the actions they may feel it's appropriate to take. Action on tobacco and alcohol in recent decades has resulted in large part from coalitions of public health academics and organisations working closely together to publicise major areas of concern and identify it as risk-based recommendations. These recommendations are then used to enforce strong coalition press for action with a focus on prior coverage of the media. This study suggests that the gambling area seems to lack these consensus approaches and coalitions and there are very few independent academics either active in the area or able to work effectively with the media to promote reform. We had some discussions when we were preparing this paper about whether there is genuinely a lack of an attempt to influence public debate, so whether it's that people are not interested in trying to influence media debate, or whether it's that people are trying to influence the debate and are not able to um, get the media to pick up their story. 
Um, and we had an interesting presentation earlier today from Graham Ramsey of the Problem Gambling Foundation of New Zealand, who was talking about the way that they have had success in using the media in New Zealand. So I think um, what I would say about that is uh, we can see from what has been successfully achieved by um, the Problem Gambling Foundation in New Zealand that it is possible to successfully engage with the media about gambling and so that perhaps we do need to use some of those approaches in Australia to try and engage more with the, um, the media and to have more of a public health voice in the coverage of gambling. Uh, finally, the voices of problem gamblers were very rarely included in newspaper articles. When their voices or examples of their stories were included, these were mostly framed around personal responsibility difficulties. This could be for a number of reasons. Problem gambling is a health problem characterised by intense stigma, with very few national or in international initiatives aimed at comprehensively tackling this stigma. As such, it's unsurprising that individuals who have experienced the problem of gambling are reluctant to tell their story and contribute to the public debate on gambling reform. Unlike other key public health issues such as mental health, alcohol and drug use, cancer, HIV, AIDS and many more, there are no independent peak bodies in Australia in gambling to provide a strong consumer-driven advocacy voice. Such coalitions provide a continuing means <coughs> of ensuring public awareness of these problems, including the ways in which individuals and their families and social circles are affected. There is clearly a need for a stronger consumer voice in the debate around gambling to ensure that those most affected by the proposed reforms have an opportunity to have an influence on the debate. So quickly some conclusions from my presentation. While the solutions to problem gambling were frequently discussed and debated, there was a lot less emphasis on the causes and consequences of problem gambling. It's important that there isn't much influence, emphasis placed on the causes of problem gambling because um, where we can talk about the role of the industry in creating problem gambling and, and um, what was being talked about earlier today of help, harm promotion um, is where we talk about the causes of problem gambling. As in research on the media reporting and other public health issues, there's a tension between reporting which focuses on responsibility of individual problem gamblers compared with reporting which focuses on broader social, ecological and industry determinants of this, of this important public health issue. Um, the debate of, of over problem gambling was really highly politicised, but there was few consumer or public health voices. And I think our analysis suggests that in Australia there's space for academic health professionals and consumers to play a much greater role in the debate over problem gambling. Thank you.